Years ago, when Russ and I used to travel to New York City regularly to see his cancer doctor, we saw a striking billboard sponsored by the United Methodist Church. The billboard boldly announced, fear is not the only force at work in the world today. This billboard was placed there shortly after 9-11. When we returned to Maine, I went online to find out more about the billboard and discovered it wasn't the only one. There were several scattered throughout the city, and the original billboard stood 45 feet high in the Wall Street district of Manhattan, just two blocks from Ground Zero, where for a couple of years it offered passers-by those words of encouragement and hope. Fear is not the only force at work in the world today. The billboard was, according to a Methodist church executive, a bold proclamation of our belief in the God who is at work in the world even now, empowering us, healing us, and bringing new life to places where fear seeks to disable and diminish us. If we dig beneath those words just a little, we find the assumption that Christianity is not a faith of fear. That it is, in fact, a faith that vigorously opposes the forces of fear. You would never know that, however, to look at the very first members of Christ's church, the disciples, as we find them trembling like cornered mice after the crucifixion. They sit huddled and hiding in a locked room, terrified, tired, overwhelmed by the death of Jesus and by everything that has happened since. Jesus has called them to be a community of extravagant and fearless love with the gates wide open and the mats, welcome mat, rolled out. But, but we find them in this scripture lesson barricaded in a house with the doors bolted shut. Jesus has called them to be the kind of people who stride boldly into the world. Yet here we find them cowering in fear, hoping nobody will find out where they are before they get their alibis straight. In short, we see here the church at its worst, scared, disheartened, and defensive. The women have told these disciples that Christ is risen, but they cannot bring themselves to believe it. Two of the disciples have already met the risen Christ on the road to Emmaus, but they were, to use the words um, we read in the gospel that Jesus spoke, uh, they were slow of heart to believe, as are the rest of the disciples when they hear what, as, what has happened. So, so there they sit, stewing in their own fears, shaking in their own sandals, into this fear, Jesus enters, saying, Peace, peace be with you. Letting them know there is no reason to fear after all. He is really with them, and it is time for them to move beyond their fears. They have work to do. They have a church to become and a church to build. They have been given an astonishingly high calling that is to proclaim to all the nations the work of God, the path of forgiveness and peace. It will not be possible for these disciples even to begin this remarkable mission until they have released their fears and once again placed their trust in, in God. In returning to the disciples, in offering them peace, in addressing their fears, in defining their, the scope of their mission, the risen Christ begins the process of creating a fearless church for a frightened world. 
The world needs the church to be fearless. The world needs the church to be a stronghold of love, a beacon of Christ's justice and peace in the midst of very different definitions and understandings of those words, a place that offers alternatives to dread and panic, a family that produces brave saints. Speaking of brave saints, I know that a number of you participated in the March for Our Lives a couple of weeks ago. Some of you went to Newcastle, some to Brunswick, some to Portland, some to Boston. Three of you went all the way to Washington, D.C. Two of our church members participated in a march in France while they were there. Russ and I participated as well. We went to confront the fear of gun violence that grips the nation. We went to support students who are trying to make our schools and our world safer. We went as disciples of the Prince of Peace who walked that road of nonviolence, the same road lifted up by Martin Luther King Jr., the, the road of nonviolence, all the way to the cross. And along the way, asked disciples to put those weapons down. We went because fear is not the only force at work in the world today. Well, no disciple is ever completely fearless, and no church is ever as fearless as it could be, never as intrepid in its welcoming, in its giving, in its proclaiming, in its justice-seeking, in its peacemaking, in its loving, never as fearless as it could be in all of that. But what if? What if the church could be completely fearless? What if it had no fear at all? No fear of losing members? No fear of not meeting the budget. No fear of being belittled in public opinion. No fear surrounding its own viability. No fear of its own mission. No fear of singing a new song or trying a fresh way of doing things or tackling a difficult situation or discussing a scary subject. No fear of speaking God's truth in love to a world that needs that truth and cries out for that love. How joyful the church would be and how contagious the joy if we could remove all fear from the agenda. What is the first thing the disciples experienced when they began to release their fear? Joy. Joy. They felt joy. A fearless church is a joyful church. A fearless church spends less time fretting and more time celebrating. A fearless church spends less time begging and more time joyfully serving. A fearless church spends less time trying to squeeze into somebody's doctrine and more time eagerly pursuing God's truth. A fearless church boldly proclaims the Prince of Peace in a world of violence. A fearless church marches for all lives. The world counts on the church for all that fearlessness. In fact, when something really scary happens in the world or in someone's personal life, people very often show up in church, maybe for the first time in a long time, because they believe that here they will find something bigger, something more powerful than their fears. There is a lot of fear-mongering going on right now in the world. The world counts on the church to fly in the face of fear, to hope in the face of despair, to practice faith consistently and valiantly, to set a holy table for all when the world is starving. 
to offer the same sacred message Jesus offered those frightened disciples, saying, Peace be with you, peace be with you. Let us then, like those first disciples, cast off our fears. Let us remember that God is at work in the world even now, empowering us, healing us, bringing new life, and granting us courage for whatever we are called to face and to do. Amen. <laughs>